A strong Roman Catholic ethos pervaded all aspects of Irish life in the 1970s, and state laws reflected Catholic teaching. With the impact of the media, controversial issues like the legal ban on contraception were brought directly into people's living rooms for the first time. Well, girls, what did you think of that balanced broadcast? Well, I thought Jack Finch was very balanced. He never mentioned contraception. Well, neither did the Minister Gronier. He doesn't go in for that sort of thing. There was no state divorce, but Catholics could have their marriage annulled through a church court, which wasn't recognised by the state. It's no laughing matter, Michael. For all I know, maybe she's going ahead with this annulment nonsense and saying nothing to me about it. Of course she's going ahead with it. From the 70s, the state began to break away from its Roman Catholic influence and identity. The letting go of old certainties and traditions would create a turbulent and divisive period in the nation's development. The changes in Irish society have been quite enormous, particularly the power and influence of the Catholic Church. We went from a society in which the priests and the bishop had enormous power and influence, not only uh, uh, over government and politicians, but also in everyday life, in terms of what people did and said. We've gone from a culture of self-denial, of uh, dedication uh, to the greater cause of society, of the community, of the family, to people fulfilling their own desires, their own um, quest for pleasure, excitement, and uh, fulfillment of self. That has been the major change. A survey in the early 70s examined the religious practices, attitudes and beliefs of Irish people at the time. The survey also asked about attitudes to confessions. Those who go every week or fortnight amount to 10%. Those who go every two months, 54%. So on mass and confession, the survey would indicate very little weakening of loyalties or practices. So on the face of it there, good news for people who might well be concerned about the situation of the Catholic Church in Ireland. I think the statistics that are often trotted out about the number of people going to Mass and their adherence to the Church, I'd be always a bit sceptical about how valid they were, I have to confess. You know, people might be asked, did you go to Mass? And they said, yes, they mightn't have. Well, they might have occasionally. So I think surveys and everything that come from that period, 74 survey, I have to confess I was always sceptical that that was as valid as it appeared. Church and state worked side by side as the nation moved cautiously into the modern world. State laws recognised the special position of the Catholic Church and politicians showed a deference to the power and authority of the hierarchy. The Church has exerted a very considerable influence even in political affairs. I don't think the influence has ever been as uh, pervasive or complete as the influence of the Orange Order in Northern Ireland. I think that must be said, but it has been considerable. The Catholic Church did not set out to dominate the Free State when it was founded in 1923. And indeed, some of the po politicians who came to power with de Valera had originally been quite anti-clerical because they'd been sort of old Republicans and they'd even been excommunicated as young men sometimes for their activities. But what really happened is you can see when you read through the documents of the time is that little by little the values of Catholic Ireland seeped into the state and seeped into the nation. Partly because, you know, 98 or 95% of the people were Catholics. One area where state law reflected Catholic teaching was the ban on artificial contraception. By the late 60s, a growing number of Irish citizens wanted access to reliable methods of contraception. And there was an expectation, even among bishops, that the church was going to change its teaching in this regard. Then, shock came in 1968 with the publication of the papal document Humanae Vitae. 
there would be no change. The document condemned as sinful any artificial methods of contraception. This particular matter of the condemnation of con contraception, um, one can easily become hypnotized by this particular thing and that it should be seen in the broader, and I think the statement says, the life-giving context of the very rich Catholic teaching on marriage and the family as a whole. I mean, there's no doubt that the publication of Humanae Vitae in 1968 was a sensational event in terms of the effect it had upon, uh, upon Catholic thinking, upon ordinary Catholics in particular, who, as you say, were uh, presuming that there would be uh, some kind of a liberalisation of the church's attitude. I mean, I think that they were within an ace of accepting the pill. I think they would have had more problems with barrier contraception because, again, of this theological background of saying nothing should come between a husband and wife in the act of marriage, in the transmission of life, as they called, as, as it's rather poetically called. Um, but certainly, uh, and, and priests were, I think, quite divided uh, privately. But Paul VI, when he was making his judgment at the time, and it was an enormous issue for him to make, as so often in the church, he was dealing with the fundamental issues and the fundamental uh, principles of life. Now, not everyone will live up to those principles, but he was also making the point that throwing aside the fundamental principles would have an enormous impact on the stability of society and family life. And 60 or 40 years later, I think some of his comments have a certain resonance in society at the present time. <laughs> I mean, the mere fact that it was something called appeal, which allowed women to regulate their fertility cycle and so on, um, was just an irresistible thing for, uh, for society and for couples. And uh, it was going to be proven possible for the church over the long term to resist um, public demand for something like the pill, which was so utterly and completely life-changing. So you had a number of things happening. You had um, society was becoming somewhat less Catholic at the same time as certain technologies were coming on stream which automatically themselves produced a more liberal attitude. One argument for action lies in the absence of control... On Although there was a legal ban on the sale and importation of contraceptives, public demand made it difficult to enforce the law. These magazines are common in supermarkets around the country. We were anxious to see how easy it is to import contraceptives from abroad. The first step is to get a couple of these magazines. Then open them up. But now there's a complication, because this advertisement is illegal. You can't advertise contraceptives for sale, even to married people in this country. The unavailability of contraception was a, a, a time bomb that was going to go off in Irish society. The question was, was who's going to let it off? It was turned out to be uh, a group of eccentric women who came down the train from Belfast. I, I certainly felt, and, and I know that the women I knew felt this, that it was outrageous that the state should, in a way, be the policeman in the bedroom. Whether you imported contraceptives for your own use was really nobody's business but yours, in a way. Uh, and maybe it was a business with your conscience, but certainly it wasn't the business of the uh, customs and excise standing at Dunleary or wherever and going through people's suitcases. And so therefore, that was one of the issues we very much took on as part of a feminist programme in 1970-71. But the pill wasn't banned. It had been available since the 60s, but only under prescription as a cycle regulator. But is it possible that a high proportion of these Irish women believe they are using the pill as a regulator? Well, it's possible, but um, I couldn't honestly accept that because what this would mean that Ireland would have the highest incidence of irregular cycles in women in the history of uh, the human race. Enniskillen, County Fermanagh, a town of roughly 10,000 people, 50% Protestant, 50% Catholic in Northern Ireland where there are no laws forbidding the sale of contraceptives. No laws. Our proximity to the north where contraceptives were widely available created a situation where condoms were being imported and sold on the black market. And the customers from the Republic, be they Protestant or Catholic, must invariably break the law at the border by lying to the customs man. Good evening. Hello. Where are you coming from? Coming from Enniskillen. 
We got any goods above you? Well, I've got some contraceptives. Well, I'm afraid you're not allowed to bring those into the country. Not even for personal use? No, not for personal use. Um, so what do I do with them? Well, I'll give you the option for uh, immediate re-exportation or else have to seize them. Now, I think if you take the figures that were there at the time, there were a lot more... Uh, I don't know where they were going, but there were a lot of contraceptives being in, imported into the country. Huge numbers. Uh, that uh, So they were going somewhere, uh, unless they were being re-exported, and that was unlikely. But uh, that was the strange part, but that in effect uh, there, were, there were huge numbers being um, imported uh, during that time. There had been a serious abdication of responsibility by In 1971, the Senator Mary Robinson proposed a bill to make contraceptives available in a limited way under medical supervision from hospitals, chemists and health clinics. I think that, that this is not a legal problem, or it oughtn't to be a legal problem, it's a, a moral and medical and personal problem, personal responsibility. And uh, I propose to have quite a short technical legal bill which will repeal Section 17 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act 1935, which makes it a crime to sell or have for sale or advertise contraceptives. And also After that, the bill was introduced, the bishops made a statement, and they laid out clearly that this was a matter of public morality, it was not a matter of private morality, and that in their opinion, the availability of contraceptives would not be for the common good of society. Meanwhile, uh, the uh, Archbishop of Dublin, who was a constituent of mine out in Kilhiley, he had issued pastorals saying that uh, this would be a curse upon the country, uh, that the people of Ireland would be decimated if, uh, with immorality and licentiousness if we dared to bring in or even contemplate bringing in legislation of that nature. This young Dublin woman... The bill never got through the Senate. Two years later, the Supreme Court ruled in the McGee case that the ban on the importation of contraceptives was unconstitutional, that Mrs McGee had a right to import contraceptives for personal use. This ruling forced the coalition government to act. The Taoiseach, Liam Cosgrave, was regarded as a conservative Catholic, yet it was his government that was proposing to legislate for the sale and importation of contraceptives. The contraception legislation we introduced was in response to the McGee case and um, the government uh, felt that we needed to take some action on that and that a bill should be drawn up. However, there wasn't full agreement on it uh, and as it was a moral issue, we thought that, as happens in other countries like Britain, for example, uh, there could be a free vote on it. But the bill had to be drawn up professionally by the Department of Justice and introduced by the Minister of Justice. And that had never happened here before or since, I think, a government bill with a free vote. <laughs> We're just not used to that in Ireland. Um, moral issues are decided by the whip. In Britain, they're decided by a free vote. Moral issues have got to sexual matters, I mean. Now, the bishops had to face the reality of that, and they did. They did. Now, they didn't like it because they would not agree and still don't agree that, that contraception is, is acceptable. Uh, that is, in other words, that is for the well-being of people. Uh, we, we don't accept that. But uh, on the other hand, um, people are free agents, and, and we are not going to force. And we have never, we have never tried as a, as a group of people to force our will on people. The church personified by Cardinal. Connell. The government plan to introduce legislation on contraception prompted the Catholic hierarchy to issue a definitive statement on the matter. And it's capable, I think, of two interpretations. One is. Uh, that the church is saying uh, we are against it uh, but if you want to go ahead and change it do so are you saying that we're saying what the statement says and i think it's very clear and it doesn't require any gloss read it's a very clear statement the 1973 statement was a watershed statement. What they said in that statement was that contraception is always wrong and it didn't matter whether state law changed or not, that contraception was wrong as far as Catholic Church teaching was concerned. Now, what was important, though, that they followed on from there and they said that this did not mean per se that it had to be prohibited. The fact that it was prohibited in church moral teaching did not mean it had to be prohibited in state law. And this was a very important uh, remark from their point of view because essentially they were separating state law from Catholic Church teaching. Now in a sense that was, people would perceive it as a change, whether it would have been a change is another question, 
They hadn't issued as many statements previous to that, but from then on they were issuing statements all the time in a sense because of all the issues that came, began cropping up. So it was a major change for the church, I'd have to say, that 73 statement. And I think politicians took the signal as well. And they had to deal with the situation at the found on the ground. We helped bring Brian a free vote in Dáil Éireann was unusual. As a result, there was some confusion about how members of the government would vote on the bill proposed by Minister for Justice Paddy Cooney. So when it came to the vote, uh, we were voting and uh, Liam Crosby was sitting in the seat and, and John Kelly realised from something he said or did that he was going to vote against. And he said, but Tisha, you're going to vote against. You should do so now because otherwise people would be misled. They'd have voted for thinking you were voting for. Whereas he was holding back to the end not to influence people, pretty honourably, he thought. So he then got up and voted and then subsequently... Some others followed his example, voting against the bill was defeated. He was trying to do the right thing. He was trying to accept the view that government legislation was needed. He wasn't going to vote for it, but it went through the door, that's all right. Um, but, uh, and he wanted not to influence it by his own actions. But it turned out it, a bit of a mess. And I have to say, I was in the front bench having voted when he went, as we thought, the wrong way. I must say, Pat, Pat Cooney and I smiled at that. <laughs> At the situation we now got ourselves into, we laughed at <laughs> uh, the absurdity, but it wasn't a joke. It was a real problem for us after that. Apart from the Taoiseach voting against his own party, the Minister for Education, Dick Burke, also voted against. The rule of Rome, the pressures from Archbishop McQuaid, the pressures from the hierarchy, the pressure from local uh, priests and so on, on people, such as Dick Burke, who responded to that, meant that he went completely with Liam Cosgrave. Now, he didn't tell his colleagues he was going to do that either. So they felt that they were, putting it very crudely, conned by both of them. Speaking in general terms about the position of a legislator, it is always a problem for him to judge between his own personal beliefs and what he perceives to be the common good of the greater number. Uh, I'm always reminded of Jack Kennedy's Profiles in Courage, although it's a different context. Well, people had to make decisions uh, that went against their own particular political preferment in order to carry out an ideal that they upheld. Well, you have to make up your own mind on an issue. Um as to where the public good lies. And uh, as a legislator, you're not acting as an individual. I might have my own views on contraception. Um, but that didn't mean I should impose them on others. And, of course, I felt that the Church had taken a wrong turning in contraception. If the Pope had accepted the advice given to him by the commission he set up and taken a different view, oh, the authority of the Church would not have been as undermined as it was by Humanae Vitae and contraception. Um, but basically, our job as legislators is to do that which uh, is required for the common good as we see it. And uh, we have a, if we have a different personal view, so be it. People have to make decisions whether they're politically uh, acceptable or not and take the consequences. The public out there who are cynical about politicians would prefer, I think, people to make decisions not where the greatest vote will lie, but where they perceive the person who is taking the decision is striving with all his defects to achieve the greatest amount of common good for the greatest number of people. But it's a difficult question, and uh, people should not be criticised unduly if they sometimes feel that it's more important uh, to be able to live with her conscience than to act in the popular fashion.